Well, my dear brethren, we will continue this evening what we left off last night. And as the church it seems to be more people here in the church than there were last night, just for the sake of those who clearly weren't here, I'll just uh, say a few words to recapitulate what we said last night. But uh, this conference, uh, as you've been told, is about the holy sacrifice of the Mass and really how we can try to benefit from it to the maximum. And the, the general tenor of the thing is to give us maybe not so much a new angle but a new way of participating in the Mass which is in fact a very antique way of participating in the Mass so that not that we should change our habits but that as I said earlier that habit can become uh, what a bit monotonous and we become creatures of habit Variety being the spice of life, I think, is also applied to our religious devotions and our religious practices we can refresh. And I made the observation that uh, for most traditional Catholics, and, and this is not a criticism by any manner of means, that uh, the tendency very often to come to the Holy Mass, the sacred action of the Holy Mass, the renewal of Christ's passion and death on Calvary, is to open our book and put our nose in our book until the end. So it becomes something of a kind of a, a spiritual reading and we hardly even observe and watch what's going on. When of course the Mass is the sacred action. It is not like a Protestant service. Remember I quoted the words of uh, Car Cardinal Newman in his novel Loss and Gain last night. That the Mass as, as compared to Protestant services is the action of Christ. In Protestant services, it's the Christian community getting together to praise God by saying their prayers, listening to sermons, or you know, singing hymns of praise. It's the action of the community. But in the Catholic Church, the Mass is not the action of the community, essentially, it's of course secondarily, but it's essentially the action of Christ. And so we come to participate at the Holy Mass, the great sacred drama. You know, people spend an absolute fortune. They spend, I don't know, goodness how much they spend to go, for example, to the other side of the world, say to Oberammergau, to look at the Passion Play. I've never seen the Oberammergau Passion Play, but I'm sure it's very beautiful and very impressive and, and well worth the money. But every day, if we can come to a far greater Passion Play than the, than the Oberammergau one, which is the real one. It's not a play at all, it's the actual reality. And so it strikes me as a bit odd that uh, we don't very often pay attention to it. And as I said, the whole ritual of the liturgy is precisely to, uh, to present to our senses that unfolding drama. Unlike, obviously, Protestant worship, where the minister comes in, he stands by the altar, he gets in the pulpit, and he says his prayers, and everybody joins in with him. It's not. We're doing strange things. We are wandering about from this side of the altar to that side of the altar. Things are being given to us. We're putting them in. We're drinking things and eating things and doing all sorts of things. It's a, it's a whole unfolding drama, really. Theatrical piece, if you like, par excellence. And so I don't think, that's, as we wouldn't go to the theatre and to a play and read the programme <laughs> instead of looking at the play, I think that that's the thing to do. Now, of course, what I'm saying is a bit contrary to all the modern notions of how we should participate at Mass. Because this is, as I say, this is an old, old fashioned form. I mean, the modern way, of, by modern, I mean, what we, what we call traditionalist, the way of, of, of Mass, which was popular throughout the whole 19th century, which of course is called the Missal, and follow it in the Missal, <coughs> a, um, depends on the fact that you can read, to start off with, <laughs> that you actually can afford to buy a Missal. Well, everybody can buy a Missal nowadays because books are um, incredibly cheap. But in the past, that was not the case. Most people, well, for the whole history of the church until modern times, people can read to start off with. And even if they could read until the middle of the 19th century, books uh, were not mass produced like they are now. They were even uh, very, very expensive items for the, average, for the average person. So that is not by any means actually really the traditional way of, uh, of, of assisting at mass. Nor was it listening. Because remember, in, 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 certainly in the past, in big, in, in big churches, you couldn't hear what was going on at Mass anyway. The church was too big. 
And of course you've heard the expression, the pious mucker of the mass, even some society priests, you can't hear what they're saying, even with microphones. <laughs> so the, the pious mutter of the mass was a reality. That's why if you go into any old church, big church, you'll find the pulpit is not here, up beside the altar. You'll find it's halfway down the church. And the reason it's halfway down the church, you might think, that's strange. People who are at the front, they can't see, they can't see the preacher. That's because if he was at the front, half the church wouldn't hear what he was saying. So what, how people participated essentially in the Mass was by looking at it, by watching it. Now I know that in the Middle Ages, at a certain time in the Middle Ages, in order to emphasize, maybe overemphasize, the, the sacred precinct of the sanctuary and so on, they sometimes built screens across the church so that it became difficult to see the Mass. But it, well, they were never, to the best of my knowledge, they were never completely enclosed screens except in monastic and convent establishments you could see through them and you could see what was going on and that's the essential thing and that's why I think all the ritual movements of the mass really in a remarkable sense even follow the events of the sacred passion without and I must emphasize this fact without intending to do so I will repeat again what I said last night because it's an important thing that the liturgy up until the time of Pius V when it was codified was a developing thing over centuries and the ceremonial that we have now is a kind of synthesis of all these different things they were never intended to show a chronological sequence of the history of the passion but strangely enough you can actually read that into them and that's what people did essentially I think in the past during the Middle Ages and so on, when people couldn't hear what was going on, they couldn't uh, read, they would like to see in the Mass the actual historical unfolding of our Lord's Passion. And so that's, that's basically where we, were, where, we, where we were up to last night. Now, and again, I said, I'll just say as a practicality, paradoxically, although I have, uh, well, I've always expressed a, a certain negativity about reading books uh, during, during the Mass, it's very, <laughs> a very, uh, a very, I suppose, innovative thing to suggest that I've actually produced a book, <laughs> which is a, a contradiction in terms. And you'll find the book when you leave the church. But I want to emphasise that that book, which is really being put together because of this conference that I was giving tonight, and it's a subject that I'm particularly interested in, which is why I produced this little book, is not intended really to be read at mass or you, know, you can bring it to Mass if you want to bring it to Mass but it's a simple book so that it can be easily memorised so that you don't need the book any longer it's deliberately not an elaborate book with hard covers and everything it's a deliberate ephemeral book so that if, you, if you're interested in this, me, this manner of participating in the Mass a, uh, basically participating without a book a, uh, then the book is be produced in order to be dispensed with afterwards. That's why it's very simple. And uh, also, I've said that uh, because I, I, this is a, a, ma a method which is m not a new method, uh, and uh, therefore I was able to get some antique engravings of the mass, which are very charming because they are antique and they're lovely. But also, the, the movements of the mass corresponding to the to the um, to the unfolding of the passion is very very charmingly represented because at each move movement the altarpiece behind changes according to at what stage you're in the sacred passion it's really a lovely a lovely thing so last night we we considered the unfolding of the sacred passion up to what is now the end of the mass of the catechumens and so we just left our lord having been acquitted basically acquitted uh, ridiculed but acquitted uh, by herod it now returns to Pilate. So the priest goes from the gospel side to the centre of the altar. And there, at least in certain masses, is the creed uh, recited. Now, as I said to you, some of these things are my fancy or my sort of, I'd hasten to say devotion because I'm not that devout, but some of my sort of ideas, uh, so they're not necessarily found in any, in any authority. But I think that it's a good thing to consider that the, the creed at this point is a reaffirmation of our faith, a reaffirmation of the truth. Because, <laughs> remember, that Pilate, 
had got rid of Jesus and sainted to Herod because he didn't want to get involved with the truth and the implications of the truth that that would have for the execution of justice. That's why I say to our Lord, what is truth? And walked off, like nearly all the agnostics of, of today. And he wanted to put his responsibility onto somebody else. And that person did, as so often happens, and I didn't take the responsibility. And so, far, so poor old Pilate, I, I, I can't help feeling a sort of, a, 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 sort of a, a tinge of a sympathy for him, really got himself into an awful mess because he would not recognise truth, therefore justice, and he followed the way of compromise. And the way of compromise is a very modern way too. But compromise does not cannot work when it comes to compromising absolute principles. I'm not saying compromise should never be done, that compromise is necessary for, for, for the peaceful uh, running of society, but compromise on absolute principle and truth can never work. The, the, the great uh, Scottish author Sir Walter Scott in, in one of his poems uh, said these famous words, oh what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And that once we practice to deceive, we get ourselves tied up in all sorts of ways that we did not expect. And that's what happened to, to our pilot, because he deceived himself. He thought he probably fooled himself. It was probably for the greater good of everybody if he made some compromise in here. And so he continued on that path. So the high priests now, getting more and more irate, they'd made up their minds our Lord had to be executed for what they considered to be the gravest reasons, Pilate tried to calm them off by sending them to Herod. Herod more or less laughed and ridiculed our Lord and therefore, don't forget, ridiculed them for having had the audacity and the effrontery to waste his time by actually bringing our Lord along. We like to think of our Lord being sort of a Herod dressed him as, uh, um, up as a fool, as a mock king. But by doing that, Herod was also giving the high priest a bit of the shove too. So that by the time they got back to Pilate, they were very, very annoyed and very irate indeed. And so when Pilate was there, and presumably he saw them, and these, these high priests, even for the Roman governor, were a power to, be, to contend with, even though he knew the accusation was false, he'd acquitted our Lord, Herod had acquitted our Lord, he says to them these dreadful words, Look, you brought this man to, to, to me, and I find that your accusation doesn't stand up. Not only that, I've sent him to Herod. And he agrees his accusation doesn't stand up. So, so, da da da, going to release him? No. I will punish him. I will chastise him and release him. Wow. Oui. Because he had to show that he was taking the accusation of these priests seriously. And so, just at that moment, when it looked as though the high priests were going, to, were going to be foiled, at that moment the crowds started gathering outside the Herod's praetorium and asking them that the old tradition that a certain a captive a prisoner should be released to them. This was a thing I don't think was to happen throughout the whole Roman Empire. It happened only amongst the Jews and it was probably related to the Passover as the Jews had been released from their bondage in Egypt as an act of generosity. They let criminals go free uh, on the, at the Pasch. And so, wow, there's another excuse. So Pilate thought, my goodness, that's great. I can get rid of him that way. I can release him without any judgment being made, whether he's innocent or guilty. And so just at that particular moment, Pilate's wife sent him a message and said, don't get involved in this. Have nothing to do with this just man. And of course that gave the high priests time to decide and to encourage the crowd to choose not Jesus, but a real criminal, Barabbas. It's funny how God intervenes in things, isn't it? Do you sometimes think that the, uh, the, 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 these strange things, why, why, would, why, why, would her, why would Pilate's wife say to him in the, at the tribunal, why would, she, why would she be concerned about that? 
There's something about wives, of course, who are, the women are very intuitive, but it seems on, on the, at great moments of history, that's when women come into their own in their intuition. But I wonder if Pilate remembered, it was a few, it was a few decades earlier, that at the murder of the greatest, one of the greatest of all the Romans, Julius Caesar, that his wife, Pompania, had a premonition that he was going to be assassinated. And she begged him not to go to the Senate on that day. She implored him, she did everything. But she, he ignored her advice and he ended up being assassinated. <laughs> and it's a curious thing that Pilate ignored the advice of his wife on this occasion and he ended up being guilty of the blood of our Lord. So, our, so, so here we are at the centre of the altar. We've said the creed, we, we, we make our own declaration of faith, we're like the sort of the audience if you like, so making our declaration of faith and then the drama unfolds. The priest comes round, he says the dominus tomb for biscuit, he so to speak appeals to the crowd. Who are they going to have? Jesus or Barabbas? And of course they call for Barabbas rather than Jesus. And Pilate says to them, well what will I do with Jesus? Who is your king? And they cry out for the first time, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, well, why? What for? Crucify him. Crucify him. So Pilate thinking, oh, oh dear, what do I do now? And but he's still hesitating. He decides that he will have Jesus, as he originally planned, scourged. Because to be scourged was very often the prelude to crucifixion anyway. So thinking that these people were priests, <laughs> that they might have soft hearts and take pity on people, eh? well, he maybe thought that they, that they would relate when they saw Jesus crucified. And so that's when at this stage, you see the, the priest takes the, the veil off the chalice and puts the water and wine into the chalice, as so to speak, our Lord's blood uh, be, 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 being shed. And as, and, and as I said before, that when you, look at, when you actually look at the prayers, the, the, the offertory prayers, you can see how we, we, we just said that the, uh, the Mass is the commemoration of the, the, uh, the Passion, the, the Resurrection of our Lord, and it's at this moment that the Church refers to this in the, in the prayer to Shippi Sancti Bata, that now our Lord is about to offer himself the crucifixion, the offering, the first part of the perfect sacrifice. Remember the first part of the offering, the consummation, of the immolation and, the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the destruction of the victim and then the, 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 the burning by fire and the uh, acceptance by God. So Jesus is scourged. The water and wine are put into the chalice as a representation surely of our Lord's blood being flown. The offering to Almighty God is a, a figure of our Lord surely offering himself in his soul, in his spirit to the will of his heavenly father. The priest puts the pole back on the top of the chalice and some, some medieval uh, mystic see in that, the, the, the crowning with thorns. So the, the, as the pole is put on the chalice, Jesus is crowned with thorns and then the priest bows down and says the prayer in spiritu militatis. So he says a prayer of humbling himself before Jesus crowned with thorns just as the soldiers mocked our Lord, gave him false homage, and we, of course, we're not giving him false homage. We are giving him real homage to make up for the false homage. So it's a lovely sort of, uh, it's a lovely sort of beautiful, a uh, beautiful thing. And then at that point, we pray that, that the Holy Ghost uh, should de de descend upon the offerings and that they should be transformed into, into Christ's body and blood. And the, uh, a, French, uh, a French writer of the 19th century says, All is now ready and before God. The bread and wine which are to be changed into the body and blood of Christ. Also our hearts, humble and contrite, which should be transformed by grace into the likeness of Jesus. The offering is complete. But the great change, the blessed transformation, can be operated only by the Holy Ghost, the Sanctifier. It is his to produce Jesus Christ upon the altar as he formed Christ's sacred body in Mary's womb. It is his to consume the substance of the bread and that of the wine by the fire of his power. It's interesting that the Holy Ghost is the fire. The fire who consumes the sacred victim, just as in the Old Testament the victims were slaughtered and then burned. 
and to destroy all of our sins or terrestrial affections by the fire of his love. Isn't that a beautiful and, 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 and a lovely consideration? And then of course, the, uh, the, the, uh, having, having, having scourged our Lord, Pilate then presents him to the people and says, look, I am now, this is an extraordinary thing to say too, I am bringing this man, now crucified, now crowned with thorns, and crucifixion was a dreadful, very often people died at these flagellations, they were so terrible. Crucified, and I'm bringing him forward in the state to show you that I think he's innocent. These are all lessons for us really, that I find no cause in this man. What massive, what massive not only miscarriage of justice, but the judge himself recognises it's a miscarriage of justice. Don't be surprised if we're going to have miscarriages of justice. That's exactly what would happen to, 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 to our blessed Lord. And so they said to him, no, crucify him, crucify him. And he said, well, why? What evil has he done? And so they said to him, we, and then they come clean, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he made himself the son of God. Now, the Romans uh, believed in many gods. So they, and if you, if you read, uh, those of us who uh, once upon a time were brought up on reading stories of Greek and Roman mythology and all that kind of thing, that's all gone by the by now. We know the exploits that these gods and goddesses used to get up to by coming to earth and doing all sorts of extraordinary things. So Pilate was probably, although he was a, not a, a believer in the absolute truth, he probably was a superstitious man still nevertheless, like a lot of non-believers are. And he feared now what he was actually dealing with. And so he said to our Lord, where, where, where have you come from? Where have you come from? Are you superhuman? And our Lord didn't answer him. He'd already, been, he'd already rejected truth, absolute truth. And so like the high priest elicited from our Lord his own condemnation by insisting on his authority as a high priest, Pilate insists on his authority as a judge and he says why don't you answer me don't you realize I have the power to crucify thee or the power to release thee and then our Lord speaks and he said you would have no power unless it were given to you from on high nevertheless they who have delivered me to you have the greater sin and from that moment Pilate did his utmost to release our Lord and of course when he went back, we've got all this going back and forth because the, the high priests being so religious didn't dare to go into, into the house of a pagan because if they did that, that terrible crime actually entering into the building of a pagan would have come ritually unclean and they wouldn't have been able to celebrate the past that year. Speak about religious scrupulosity, eh? it's like often with religious people, but so it's not scrupulous people, they're scrupulous about little things, but they can swallow great big things. Sometimes we're all a bit like that too. And the priests knowing that, realising that he was going to try to release him, preempted him and said, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. For whosoever speaketh against Caesar, is a rebel. And from that moment, Pilate knew it was finished. These were serious, important people who could easily and had already, on several occasions, denounced him to Rome. And if he'd gone along with it, if he'd released our Lord, his career would have probably been finished. And so, for all these other considerations, he allowed our Lord to be condemned. Now, the, history, the history we do know about Pilate's life later is, the, uh, is in fact the, um, uh, authoritative. What often happens to people who do this kind of thing, and there are many examples, within a few years he had blotted his copybook. He had, he had been uh, announced by the Jews and was put into exile and eventually, supposedly, committed suicide. What a lesson all these events are. So we see as we follow the sacred passion life, we can think of all of these things, and not just the things that happened 2,000 years ago, but their implications for us. That's the real essence of it. So Pilate, of course, washes his hands, 
and says, no, I've got, it's, it's not quite clear at the, the, the part of the sacred passion where at what point Pilate washed his hands. Some people think before the scourging, some people think after the scourging, just at the condemnation. But anyway, here, as, as the ritual of the Mass unfolds, our Lord is scourged, Pilate washes his hands at the lavabo, just as the priest comes, and then the priest comes to the middle and he says, orati fratres, he turns to the people as if saying to populace, behold a man, and they declare that he is to be crucified and condemned. And so at that, at that stage the priest then says the, the secret prayer. Now, the secret prayer is ge generally it's thought to be called a secret because it, of the three collects in the Mass, the, 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 what we call the collect and the secret and the post-communion, it's the only one which is said silently. But there's another reason why it's called secreta. It's, a, um, it, it's from the participle of secernary, which means separated. And as the gifts offered to God, the bread and the wine, are separated from ordinary use in order to be sacrificed at the Holy Mass, so as our Lord separated and he becomes the offering, the oblation. And in, in, in certain ancient missals, the prayer of the secret is called the oratio superablata, over the, over the offerings. And it's interesting, when you look at, the, look at the, many of the secret, not many of them, but there's a good few of the secret prayers, which refer to the, to the bread and the wine, at this point, either as offerings or as gifts, but sometimes as victims. But the, the sacred species, the, but, but, but the bread and wine at this stage are not this, the victim, not become our Lord, but in anticipation. So I like to think that the secret prayer is a representation of our Lord's condemnation. He has now been condemned and outcast. So at this stage then, he goes, leaves the Praetorium and goes to Calvary. Now it's a very interesting thing at this stage because now the preface is recited. Now, the preface is a, a, is a song, but it's sung of course, so you, it's a hymn or a canticle of, of joy really, and of thanksgiving. But in this case I think it's true that we've also got to enter our plea of thanksgiving to our blessed Lord for taking upon himself our sins, for willingly humbling himself even to the death of the cross, and to, a, uh, and to go forth to Calvary. So if we consider the preface, the way to Calvary, and the preface of course ends with the Sanctus, and the Sanctus is a threefold petition. A sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. I like to think it's a kind of a fanciful thing where you know, that these, are the, that these sanctus are Lord being hammered, the, the nails being hammered into our Lord's sacred body, if you like. I think the, the Holy Shroud shows that our Lord was, a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, crucified with three nails and not four, as was sometimes the case. Or otherwise, you can see in these things also the unfolding of the events of the Passion of, of Simon of Cyrene being condemned to, to, to carry the cross behind our Lord and of course the, uh, the, the, the wailing of the, of the daughters of Jerusalem uh, on the way and uh, either, the, either the apocryphal uh, the notion of, a, uh, of a, I'm not saying it's not true but it's not in the, in the scriptures uh, Veronica wiping the face of Jesus or Jesus meeting Our Lady You've got, I mean, all of these things are acts of piety they don't, as I say, correspond to anything actually in the ceremonies as such but as a, an act of our devotion and our following through we can see that so now by the time of the Sanctus, our Lord is crucified, he's raised on the cross, and there's now just a wait until he, is he dies on the cross at the consecration. Now during the time of his passion on the cross, you realise that of course, remember that he was mocked and he was uh, jeered at by the, uh, by the general populace, and that uh, he spoke only three times. It's already remarkable that our Lord spoke because very, he must have been in such a terrible state of, a, uh, of, a, uh, of weakness, remember he couldn't even carry the cross to Calvary, that he was even able to speak. And of course everybody's words, everything that they say has got a profound significance, so like our last will in the Testament really. And so these times that he spoke are called the, the, the seven words from the cross. And looking at, the, looking at the prayers before the canon, it just, well, when, I was, when I was thinking about this conference, there were various things which really never struck me before, a, uh, and I had not read about anywhere else actually, so it was, it was quite interesting that if you take these prayers, they, 
they, in, a, you know, in a distant sort of way, tenuous sort of way, do reflect the seven words from the cross. The very the first prayer of the canon, the Te Igita, is a prayer for the church. And it is, says, Te Igita, therefore most merciful Father. It immediately refers to our Lord, uh, to, to, to God the Father, as our Father, as our Lord's Father. The first words of our Lord on the cross are, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, these words, of course, are generally taken as being applied almost exclusively, primarily to those who were actually crucifying at the time. But these words of our Lord truly have got to be applied to the whole of history and all people who crucify him at all times during history. And it's simply a funny thing that this prayer is a prayer for the Holy Catholic Church. That we pray that, that, uh, that our mighty God should unite and govern it together <laughs> with thy servant, Francis, and all Orthodox people throughout the church. And well, look at the state of the church now. Don't you think that's a perfect prayer for the church? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Extraordinary really, isn't it? Take the next one then. The next one is the memento of the living. The memento of the living begins, memento, of course, it begins, remember, Lord, thy servants and handmaids. And so it prays for those who are, who are living, those who are, particularly those who are present at the holy sacrifice. What's the second word of our Lord on the cross? The second word of our Lord is when he says to the good thief, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it's an answer to the prayer, remember. <laughs> remember me when thou come into thy kingdom. It's beautiful really, isn't it? Marvellous. So we ask our Lord to remember us so that one day we will also be transformed into his kingdom. And then the next one is the communicantes, when we pray that uh, we should be in union at the foot of the cross with all of the saints in heaven, and particularly with our blessed lady, the first mentioned. And of course the next word of our Lord on the cross is, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Uh, on the cross our lady becomes the mother of all of the living, therefore the mother, the queen of all of the saints, the mother and the queen of all of us. The next prayer is the Hank Igita. Now the striking thing, uh, for me anyway, at least for the purposes of this conference, is not so much the actual words of the prayer, but what actually happens at the prayer. At the, at the prayer, instead of the priest usually, as he is, in the ancient way of praying, supplication, the ancient way of praying is actually like that. It's not like that. That's the later development. It's like that. That's why it shows how ancient the Mass is. The officially priest and all the great prayers is like this, holding his arms like that. That is to stay, hands outstretched at shoulder height. But instead of holding his arms like that, he holds his hands over the, the, uh, over the offerings, over the bread and the wine. And he says these prayers over the, over the wine, that God should accept this offering. We beseech you, Lord, graciously accept this offering of our service and also of thy eternal family and to dispose our days in thy peace, preserve us from eternal damnation and count us at the number of the elect. The significance of this, putting the hands over the victim, is what the priest used to do in the offerings in the temple in the old days, before they were slaughtered. And the idea was that the sins of the guilty are transferred into the victim who is offered in the place of us. And the, 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 one of the best examples once is that what, the, what, what, once every year, I think on the Day of Atonement, that the priest would actually transfer the sins of the people into a goat, which was actually not sacrificed, but was sent into the desert, cast out. And that is exactly, really, the terrible thing of the, what you see, the, the utter rejection of the victim because of the sins which it now represented is exactly what our Lord on the cross said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, so the, 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 of course, the San Deus Meus is a, is a messianic psalm which actually started a little bit startlingly, startlingly, 
prophesies not only the sacred passion but even many of the details of the sacred passion and so all thus unfolds then the next words of our Lord is I thirst when our Lord said I thirst of course he meant of course he was he, he was uh, suffering a terrible thirst which was one of the worst and dreadful punishments uh, or, or consequences rather of crucifixion some people are breaking it was uh, the worst thing of crucifixion but anyway th this thirst of course is not a physical thirst it's a thirst for us for souls and so in, the, in this for the prayer quam oblationem we ask that the, the offering should be made for us the body and blood of my beloved son Jesus Christ that our God does it through thirst for our souls and also it's now finished he's done everything and so the next words are it is consummated everything is done everything is ready everything has been prepared the victim is prepared as we already ex explained by all the events of the of the sacred fashion there's now nothing but the actual offering and so our Lord makes his offering Tala into thy hands I commend my spirit and then I think as we've said before we can't get into sacramental uh, theology but the separate consecration of the bread and the separate consecration of the blood at the mass the two separate species the two separate consecrations is the sign of the sacrament of the, uh, and the sign of the sacrifice of the mass that our Lord's sacramental death is represented by the separation of his body and his blood just like if once we lose all our blood we're dead <laughs> now of course of course it's a sacramental sign our Lord now is not dead never will be dead he's now gloriously in heaven but the sign of it is this so it's at this stage I think we must especially uh, think of our Lord's death so after his death what happens the next part of the canon the second part of the canon and the second part, part of the canon it was finally realized after all the terrible all the amazing things which had uh, occurred and now all the signs of nature the earthquake the darkness people's attitudes towards our Lord clearly changed from cha from mockery they were overawed and fearful of all these signs in nature so much so that even the centurion the pagan which is interesting after our Lord's death it was a pagan who said this was a just man this man was the son of God and, and after that we offered to God the sacred victim and again the, the prayer wounded memories insists on the fact that we are commemorating our Lord's passion and resurrection and ascension and the next thing that happened of course was that immediately after our Lord's death the veil of the temple of Jerusalem was rent and the veil of the temple of Jerusalem means the veil of the Holy of Holies the most sacred part of the temple of Jerusalem and that rending was to show that the Old Testament the Jewish religion was finished and abrogated by the death of Christ interestingly enough in this prayer we refer to all the great sacrifices of the old law deign to regard with gracious and serene countenance and accept now our Lord's victim sacramental victim on the altar as thou was graciously pleased to accept the gifts of thy just servant Abel the sacrifice of Abraham our patriarch and that which thy chief priest Melchizedek offered to thee a holy sacrifice and an unspotted victim and then we pray that the Jupiter te regamos that the gifts may be taken to heaven in anticipation of the ascension and we pray that uh, an angel take the gift of heaven that's a, that's a strange thing because we've not got any time to go into who is that angel what is this angel that comes and takes the sacrifice of the master heaven well I think that the most logical and the, 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 the most general acceptation that the angel is our Lord himself he uh, I'd referred to as the angel of the great council in the, um, in the say, pro prophet Isaiah but that's a, a, a whole profound thing which we've not got time to, to go into the next thing that happened was that the graves were open and the dead arose and so and the next prayer that we have in the canon of the mass is the memento of the dead and so we pray also for those that sleep in peace who also will be granted a place of a comfort light and peace so that the souls the souls in limbo will be released from their pains so at this time we know it's it's a it's not in it's not in the, in the gospel but it's referred to by St Peter in his epistle after our Lord's death he descended into hell he descended into hell which is limbo 
in order to announce to those in limbo their, uh, their, uh, their forthcoming at the day of the resurrection, glorious transformation into heaven. And toward the end, the priest also at the Nobis Coque Peccatoribus says aloud, We also, sinful servants, stri striking his breast, sinful servants, have you told? that after all of these events had occurred on Calvary, that the multitude left striking their breasts, striking their breasts in compunction at all the terrible things which had happened. Okay, the canon ends with the, what is called the minor elevation. So the priest makes various blessings over the offerings and he lifts them up and puts them down again. I think this is a good point to consider our Lord being taken down from the cross and put into the arms of his blessed mother. And then it's almost like another kind of interjection, like the Gloria was an interjection, uh, our Lord's declaration of his divinity to Caiaphas. The Gloria, a kind of an act of reparation for Pilate's uh, renunciation of the truth. I think now that we say the Our Father, the, 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 the Lord's Prayer, is a, a fitting conclusion to the canon and preparation for communion. And here is another uh, nice sort of, I think, consideration of that. Not only is the prayer, an interest, or obviously the best prayer that our Lord gave, but in the circumstance now. Now, at what moment do we address to heaven this divine prayer, whose every petition, independently of the grace which it solicits for us, contains an instructive lesson and deposits a pious sentiment in our heart? Powerful as it is in itself, it derives new efficacy from the circumstances under which we offer it to the Lord. The moment could not be more favourable. We have just offered to the Lord a victim which infinitely pleases him, a victim which by transmitting its merits to us gives us a right to be always heard. God sees his son immolated for his glory as well as our salvation. And that son's state of profound humiliation on the altar is in itself a touching prayer. How then could he turn a deaf ear to our petitions for the sanctification of his name, the reign of his grace over us to prepare for us his heavenly kingdom, the accomplishment of his adorable will, all the succour we need, the remission of our sins, peace with our brethren, victory over our passions and over the spirits of darkness, and finally deliverance from all evil. So libera nos amalo. Of course, the, 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 uh, the, the Libera Nos Amalo is, uh, is continued in the prayer called the Libera Nos, it's called an embolism, it's a continuation of the, of the, of the prayer of the Pater Nostra, where we ask Almighty God for peace in our days and that we may be freed from all of our sins. Having said the, the prayer aloud, the Pater Nostra is now silence while the priest says the Libera Nos, representing our Lord's silence, repose, in the tomb, in his death. But now he is to rise from the dead very shortly. So if you know that just, just after the Pater Noster, the priest says a libera, he, he breaks the host. In some commentaries they consider that to be our Lord being pierced with a lance, but you see it doesn't fit into the general thesis which I'm proposing to you just now. And after that the priest puts a particle into the wine so the species are reunited our Lord, so to speak, body and blood is reunited. He sort of sacramentally like, comes alive. He's always been alive, but he comes alive. And this represents the, the resurrection, the resurrection from the dead, which is really, I think, the second great ritual act in the Mass after the, uh, after the, the, the consecration. Thus far, the church in her ceremonies has clearly expressed only the passion of the Son of God. Now, as the sacrament of the altar is the renewal and the representation, together with the reality of all the mysteries by which he worked out our salvation, his resurrection and his glorious return to his Father on the day of his ascension must necessarily be represented as well as his death. The church does it at this part of the holy sacrifice. For the species of wine, by penetrating that of the bread, admirably expresses the reunion of the body and the blood of Christ at the redemption, and the divine glory wherewith his humanity was entirely penetrated. Therefore, while do, do we say, whilst commingling the body and blood of Christ, 
Thanks Dominus et Semper Vobiscum. Thus recalling the peace salutation which he addressed to his apostles when he appeared to them after his resurrection. It was indeed by this mystery that he established on a sure and a permanent basis our peace and reconciliation with God. He was delivered up for our sins, says St. Paul, and he rose again for our justification. So now we've commemorated our Lord's passion and his resurrection. Now the next thing, of course, which is immediately after this action is performed, is the Agnus Dei, which is called three times. And it's very appropriate that this prayer should be in the Agnus Dei because, of course, Easter, our Lord's resurrection, is figuratively represented by the Paschal Lamb, by the Lamb sacrificed in the Temple. Remember, John the Baptist referred to our Lord as being the, the, the Lamb of God. And the, and the Jews, from the time of their bondage in Egypt, had to commemorate their liberation by eating the Paschal Lamb. So we pray this, and we say it three times. And I like to, I mean, I fancy in these three times, the three first appearances of our Lord, well, the appearances of our Lord to his, to his disciples. Obviously, first of all, I'm not speaking about the apostles, the disciples. First of all, to St. Mary Magdalene. To St. Mary Magdalene, I can't go into all the, all the circumstances of that, but it's highly appropriate that he should have appeared first to St. Mary Magdalene, since he had come precisely, not to call the just, but to call sinners to repentance. And therefore, the, the St. Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast uh, seven devils, he, uh, the, the whole of evil influence, he appears to her first in the garden. And then he appears to the holy women. I would have told you all the circumstances, but you have to remind yourself. So, so, so he appears to the Holy Women, and then he appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And when the disciples come, having recognized our Lord in the breaking of bread, when they come back to the cynical to tell the apostles that they've actually seen our Lord risen from the dead, they who were reluctant to believe the, uh, Mary Magdalene were now believing because St. Peter himself had seen our Lord. They, could, they, they say to each other, the, 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 the doubters from the mayor say, we've seen him, we, we, we've had supper with him today. And they say, oh, he's already appeared to Peter. He's risen, he's appeared, he, he's, he's appeared to Peter. And thereupon our Lord himself appears, bang, in the midst of them. And the first thing that he says to them is, peace be unto you. Peace. That's what we say, we ask our Lord for, for, for peace. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the whole story that, he, uh, that he, he appears to them, and not only does he appear to them, but he, he gives them the power to remit sins. And so I think in, 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 these, in, in these prayers that you've got afterwards, the, the Annual Day ends with Dona Nobis Faction, Lord, give us peace. The first prayer, Domini Jesu Christi, the Lord Jesus Christ who has said to thine apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, regard not my sins, but the faith of the church. So we want peace of God, and peace is the tranquility of order, peace is the effect of everything being put right, everything else being put right by the passion and death of our blessed Lord, and so we pray that we have peace according to his will. And then the next, of course, we pray, that the next prayer is a, a prayer for sanctification, again, that we should be released from our sins, and that we should never be separated from our blessed Lord. And then the final prayer, of course, is a prayer for, for grace, and then there is the communion. Now, it's a curious thing, there's no record of our Lord celebrating Mass after the resurrection. After, some people seem to think, but it's generally not accepted. That, that the way, when the, the disciples from Emmaus recognized our Lord in the breaking of bread, it wasn't because he actually uh, uh, celebrated Mass or, 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 or consecrated the bread, but that they saw in him the gestures that they were familiar with, particularly when, of course, at the miracle of the, uh, the feeding of the five thousands and the manner in which he gave the bread to them, which is a much more plausible thing. But interestingly enough, of the appearances of our Lord, it's very strange how many of them are actually involved with eating. Our Lord appeared to the disciples of Emmaus. They recognized him in the breaking of bread. He appears to the apostles in the cynical. They're startled when they see him. They wonder if he's a ghost. So what does he do? He eats something. Very interesting, isn't it? He asks he asks them for something to eat. And they've just been finishing their supper, so they have a fish and a honeycomb. 
And so he eats the fish in the honeycomb, and some people see the fish in the honeycomb a representation of the Blessed Sacrament also, but there's no time to go into all of that. And then after the, after the, after the resurrection, when the, when, the, when the apostles finally go to Galilee, as our Lord had promised them, before, uh, before the ascension, they're out. They go back to their job, they're out fishing, and one morning, after they've caught nothing, like at the very beginning of their ministry, they see a man on the shore, and he asks them if they've got anything to eat, and they say no, and so he tells them to cast their net in, and then there's a second miraculous draft of fishes, as they were at the very beginning of our Lord's life. And when they pull themselves to land, and they realise that it's our Lord there, what does our Lord have waiting for them? Breakfast. He has fish, our Lord himself cooking. You know, some people think they're too high and mighty to do domestic chores. Our Lord cooked the breakfast. He had some fish, his own fish, not the ones that they brought. He did ask them for more fish, but that's another question. And bread. Isn't that remarkable? And then just before his glorious ascension into heaven, we are told that after he had eaten with them, and then he went to Mount Olivet, and then he ascended into heaven. So make of that what you will. There are, so I'm sure there are many co commentaries on it. But isn't it very fascinating, really? And so the, the, the whole Eucharistic symbolism and the, uh, the intimate uh, communication, because although the Lord didn't actually change the species into his, uh, the, the bread and the, or the fish and the honeycomb into himself, he was there with them communicating with them these sacred meals. So it's really all, I mean, it's all very wonderful, but I wish we, we had more time to go into it, but uh, yet we don't. So eventually, at the very end, the, uh, the, the thing our Lord appears, he, 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 we're only told about two major appearances. We're told he appeared many times, but the only two we're told about was the miraculous draft of fishers uh, on the Sea of Galilee at the same time when St. Peter made amends for, uh, for, his, for his betrayal and our Lord foretold his sacred passion. And I think that we can see that now in the movement at the end of the Mass, when the priest goes to the, to the, back to the, to the right-hand side, to the epistle side, and recites the communion prayer, then he comes back, and then he goes back again. Our Lord again reappears also again in Galilee on the mountain, where he was seen by all the apostles and by 500 at once. Then he comes back, so to speak, to the middle, comes back to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem, after he had dined with the, with the apostles, he ascends to heaven. And he turns around, and he blesses them, and is taken up from them. And that ascension, and that final blessing, of course, the Mass is a representation of our Lord's ascension to heaven, and the ritual of the Mass comes to a conclusion. So very, very beautiful, I think. I certainly find a, a, a great aid to my own devotion, and I hope that it will be also useful to yours. And so, one final little reading. The, uh, I mean, as I said to you, this is a very ancient uh, uh, kind of notion, a kind of medieval, really, idea to assist at the Mass in this kind of a manner. And these authorities, which I fleetingly sort of... Uh, um, read to you uh, from the, the 19th century. But I'll, fi I'll finish with a, a modern, by modern I mean you, a, 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 a quotation from a book called The Mass of St. Pius V by a Dominican, uh, the Père de Chivry, who was a Dominican, a French Dominican, who was a friend of Archbishop Lefebvre's and a great supporter of our society at its beginnings. And um, I came across a little passage from his book, which I think is really a, an appropriate conclusion to, to these two conferences and all that I've been saying to you now, because it's just all very lovely. It's a beautiful consideration, but it's meant to have some kind of a practical effect on our life. So what is that practical effect to be? Here's what he says. What we have to understand is that the Mass is not a fleeting ceremony evoking a memory symbolizing an impressive heroism and closing its meaning with the Ita Misa Est. The Mass is of a quality so superior that it sets in motion in every one of us determinations bound to be its glorious continuation throughout a whole lifetime. 
but of an effect on us to continue throughout our whole lifetime. After 20 centuries, these determinations still continue to give an exact echo of Calvary. Just as, on the cross, the morally perfect and divinely irresistible powers of the person of Christ had the courage even to embrace bodily death to affirm the untouchable and definite existence of God on Easter morning, so the living bread, Jesus' own expression of himself, is going to animate the spiritual and moral powers of each one of us. It is a principle of affirmation of our, our divinized life, operating beyond our physical powers, at the expense of our physical powers, and even in certain cases by the immolation, the offering, the sacrifice of our physical powers. That's what we've seen in our Lord's Passion. At the cost of our physical powers, beyond our physical powers and the offering, sacrifice of our physical powers in martyrdom. A mass well heard and communion well received cannot do otherwise than to compel us to act in our day in such a way that it will be an echo of the monumental labours of Good Friday in one manner and another. We just say that the mass is above all an action. And its effect is to have action in our lives. Here's another consideration. The role of nourishment, food, <coughs> which our Lord, I'm just saying, our plenty of eating after the, uh, after the resurrection. The role of nourishment is to be ground down, crushed, and broken apart. In view of its assimilation to, by the substance receiving it. So you can't really properly digest your food unless you, you know, munch it up really. Crush it. Break it up. The body of Christ on Calvary was treated like a true nourishment. But, but, and this is the difference, in view of assimilating our own existence with all of our incapacity and weakness, the role of the stronger is to act upon the weaker. And so it's not we who assimilate Christ, spiritually speaking. We receive him physically on our tongues that he might assimilate us divinely into his sacred activities. We can now draw one central idea about the action of the Mass. It is absolutely separated isolated, set apart by the states imposed on Christ, whether on Calvary or on the altar. In being so separated, he is showing us the existence which he desires for us through the Eucharist. He intends to isolate us from sin and set us apart from whatever is disordered in creation. To understand the essential detail of this idea, we have only to look at the different scenes of the Passion, which is just what we've been doing during these conferences. The agony. The agony of our Lord. Our agony. Which is the state of acceptance of being separated from physical existence, if needs be. Condemnation to death, of death. The state of acceptance of being separated from society. You know, when God chose the Jews, and it was very odd of God to choose the Jews, in the Bible we're told that they became his peculiar people. Now, the, the, the sacred scripture uses antique language, and peculiar, as it's used in the scriptures, means that unique, different, set apart doesn't have any derogatory meaning to it at all. But through the course of time, being different, separated, apart, became, in a bad sense, peculiar. And so we have now, the new chosen people of God, we are set apart 
And guess what? We've become, in the modern sense, likewise peculiar, isn't it? So the condemnation to death is a state of acceptance, in which we've got to accept, from society, or the approval of society. The scourging, a state of acceptance, of being separated from esteem and success. Because it's a crime, remember? The crime of ultimate glory and authority. Oh, it's a crime of thorns, our crime. So it's a crime to separate us from earthly glory and pride. The crowning with thorns, oh, sorry, I beg you, there's, 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 sorry, I'm saying the wrong. The scourging is a state of acceptance of being separated from the steam and excess. The crowning is a state of acceptance of being separated from the control that we dream of having over life, our life and everybody else's lives. Hmm? The carrying of the cross, a state of acceptance of being separated from the pleasant, easy activities of existence. The crucifixion. A state of acceptance of being definitively separated from the world that we live in. We all got to face death and separation one way or another. All of these states of soul were lived by Christ under the sway of a powerful interior activity unimaginable for our weakness. Such was his love, actively proving that loving first means adopting states of existence instead of talking about them without making them real. Ooh, that's frightening. I've been talking for a long time about all these things and I'm probably not making them very real either. So there's something we've all got to really think about seriously, really, because we do plenty of talking. But we can all do that, but without making it real. By the results of the Mass in us, whether by simple assistance at Mass, or by sacramental participation through communion, we are going to taste for ourselves the same active need to step beyond our eloquent personal speeches about generosity and introducing into our daily life sacramental states of soul echoing those of Jesus on Good Friday. The Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.